Hi, I'm Mayank. I'm a product manager at Booking.com. Um, today we're going to speak about Airflow at Booking.com, but as well as set the context a little bit about the entire data modernization and migration program that we are going through. So Airflow is just one part of it. So how this is going to go is, we're going to start with uh, a little bit of an introduction, then to speak of this big migration and modernization program, like I said, where we are changing our entire big data stack. Um, then to specifically focus on uh, the workflow management platform, um, and then also to speak about our integration with Astronomer this year, which we just completed before coming here. So it's gonna be the three of us talking through this. Um, yeah, just a little bit of an intro. How many of you know of booking.com? And how many of you have used it to make a booking? Okay, quite a few. Uh, right, so yeah, it's a pretty big company. Um, I think um, for, for a long, long time, Booking.com just offered hotels, but now we are expanding into, I think, five verticals. So we've got transport, we've got attractions, uh, we've got uh, yeah, flights. So basically, a one-stop shop for everything travel. And in trying to scale, one of the biggest efforts is to modernize and migrate our entire big data stack to the cloud. So this is something that is going on for the last three, four years but really accelerated this year. So we wanna give you an idea of what we are migrating away from, what we are migrating to, and like I mentioned, it's a big undertaking. Uh, and just a little bit more information about the scale at booking.com. I think that's a lot of users, but also as a product manager, to have 1,500 internal users, 1,500 data practitioners, that's pretty significant. Um, and yeah, the, just the amount of data at play here, uh, what we are migrating onto the cloud, that's a lot. And um, I'll talk more about why it's complicated. It's not just the scale of the data, it's also the kind of data, data that we have and how we manage it. All of these are the complexities that we have to deal with when we are trying to modernize and migrate. So just now specifically to talk, uh, talk about workflow migration because we've also got Tableau, we've got our data warehouse, we've got workflows. So there are three big things being migrated here using the entire new big data stack but we're just gonna focus a little bit on the workflow migration. And just to set the stage to talk about what we are migrating away from. So that's what we've been using for the last 10, 15 years. I've obviously oversimplified it quite a lot, but all our data is lying on Hadoop in the form of tables. Um, yeah, that's a problem because if you don't have data assets and then this is a, you know, the time to really check with the crowd if you guys at your companies use data assets. How many of you have data assets at your company or how many of you are just using just one? Right, so I think at some point you're all gonna start using this. Uh, this is the new modern thing and it's a big undertaking and I'll explain why. So that's one thing that we really needed to change from our big data stack, the way we just handle data at booking.com. Then obviously, well, move away from Uzi. This is, I don't think there are any Uzi conferences anymore. Uh, then we've got, of course, uh, yarn coupled with Hadoop and pretty big scaling challenges because every time we've got two big data centers, you need more compute. We keep growing as a company. Every summer we have peak period, peak time, and then already our computers, you know, even before we get to peak, uh, not enough. So we have to tackle that as well. Uh, and then finally we write back the data onto Hadoop. And generally the challenge is when you don't have data assets, you have a lot of data that you don't know much about. Who owns this data? Who are the consumers of this data? So that's what we are trying to, I mean, this is just a glimpse of it. And the next slide, a bit overwhelming, a lot of information, but I'm gonna break this down. But just to show you what we are going to, what this entire migration um, has been about. So everything from how we handle data, we do data asset management, the way we do permissions has changed. Obviously our orchestrator changes, uh, the query languages, the number of compute products that we have now, going from one to five, uh, as well as some new modern things such as open lineage, which if we had at the moment, it would have been much easier for us to migrate because we would have known the entire lineage of data workflows and it would have been, yeah, uh, a lot easier. So just to now focus on the data part, this is probably 40 to 50% of the effort just to do modern and govern data management. In this, of course, like I said, we've got 200 petabytes of data. So just putting it on S3 is already quite challenging. But the more challenging thing here is data asset management to make sure that all the data we've got lying on Hadoop, that we procedurally 
painstakingly try to understand what is this used in the context of, convert it into data assets and understand who is the owner of this, who's managing this, and who all are gonna be the consumers of it. And once you do that, this big activity, then you have Immuta, and now we have column level, level permissions. Someone can ask for access of a data asset, of a table, and a specific column only. Let's say you got PII. Now we have the capability that we give you access, but without the column that has PII. So the way we handle and manage data is completely changed, and I think we are now hitting the highest governance standards in our data management. And then of course we've changed our data warehouse as well. We use Snowflake now, and pretty neat tools to just let's say have an interface with the data. We have got data cataloging capabilities as well. So this is the data part. Like I said, it's, yeah, it could go on for hours, but this is, has been very challenging and still is. And then the second part, which is probably more, uh, yeah, more appropriate at the moment, which is orchestration and ETL. I mentioned Uzi already. Uh, we've gone to Airflow and we've also integrated with Astronomer. So there we have really hit the heights of, you know, where we want to be from a modern and governed perspective. And then the compute. I mean, I've only got two here, which is EKS and Snowflake. And even in Snowflake, you've got uh, Spark as well as DBT. But I think we also have, yeah, um, Hadoop 3 on EC2. We've got, you know, even if you want to integrate Databricks tomorrow, we can do that as well. So we have a completely extensible compute platform. And I don't think we're running out of compute anytime soon in the future. So that's a big uh, upgrade for us as well. And then because we've introduced so much complexity for the user from what you saw before, uh, we have an SDK to make it a bit easier for the user. It's a sort of user interface to hide away a bit of the complexity. We're investing in a big way over there. And what I didn't mention so far, what I skipped over is DAS and DVS, our internal products. And I think you're gonna get this because we want to do event-based triggering. We don't want just to start a workflow on a schedule. I think none of us do. And therefore we've made an internal product. The moment the data upstream is available, we have a data availability signal and that's what triggers the workflow downstream. So that's a proprietary internal product, but you understand why it's important. And now of course we've heard about data sets quite a lot uh, in this conference and we're gonna explore that as well. So that's an important part. And like I said, open lineage. Now we know all the way up and down what are the dependencies of any workflow, any data? So you see, I mean, when we are going through this migration, we had, our mission was to have governed, modern, and self-serve data products. So that's what we've now migrated to, or mi are in the process of migrating to. And now Madhav is gonna speak about just the workflow management platform, not specifically Airflow, but just the platform, how it integrates with all these new capabilities and products. And I'm gonna give it to Madhav for that. Yep, thank you, Mayank. Um, yeah, hi everyone, uh, I'm Madhav. I'm a software engineer at Booking. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk about the, the workflow management platform, the orchestrated platform, um, and I'm going to basically deep dive into it. Um, yeah, we start off with the, the design itself uh, of that platform. Uh, on the left, we see it starts with um, a user who wants to write a workflow. We, we call uh, DAGs as workflows. Um, they define uh, their workflow definition. I, I, I will also zoom into each part uh, like later in the presentation. Um, but uh, yeah, basically there's a workflow definition and then finally the workflow ends up in Airflow. Uh, and on the right are uh, the integrations to the internal service that uh, services that may uncovered, uh, which is the, the data availability service and the data compute service. And then finally, eventually it's all also connected to the the modernized data stores, like we store it in S3 Data Lake and Snowflake. Um, as you can already see in the, the, the design, um, Airflow pretty much sits uh, at the heart of uh, our platform. Yeah, so, so we, we start with um, the Airflow itself. Um, the current setup that we have, like it's, it's um, our own uh, Airflow installation that we set it up, um, like way before we started even thinking about uh, uh, migrating to Astro. So how, how did we go about it? Like uh, a few cents, like we, we used the Airflow community Helm chart. Um, and then of course, like we adapted it so that it works with booking internal uh, stuff. So we added a bunch of sidecars. Um, we also saw that the, the DAGs end up in Airflow and that's also via like an S3 sync sidecar. So we, we use S3 for storing the DAGs and then they end up into the Airflow. Um, we also do something for the logs uh, because we use like a like an old version of Airflow uh, in the current setup. So the the trigger logs um, are being shipped to OpenSearch so that the users can then also uh, view what's happening inside the trigger. 
um yeah so uh, the next part we come to is um the workflow definition i think in this conference we have heard um uh, a lot of people talk about yaml and yeah this is yet another yaml so so we have like a workflow definition format on the left you can see like a simplified um yaml and um, it, like it's it's very easy to see how powerful it is like basically a user just comes and says hey i want to run a workflow which has a single pyspark step and here is the script that you have to run inside it um and then they also talk about data assets like we we already have the the data asset concept that like mayank was also talking about um and then users can say okay my workflow uses these data assets and then also publishes these data assets like basically produces these yeah some some more motiv motivation into why a workflow definition uh, uh a lot of abstractions of course for the users so they don't have to write the python dag and uh, they only focus on the business logic a lot of standardized templates um, like basically we have the platform team who um, takes care of providing the templates so we have for example pyspark template dbt uh, sagemaker so anyone who wants to write uh, these standard type of use cases they only worry about the business logic and um, yeah they basically get a lot of functionality out of the box so uh, not a lot of users have to do the same thing again and again and worry about the internals uh, pluggable airflow backend yeah we have the we have the workflow definition and then uh, in the design it's very easy to move uh, out the the airflow installation that we have and uh, replace it with an astronomer and that is something which we'll also cover later and also governance like very important um, uh, basically we we don't allow users to write like uh python dags and then they have like free flow access to do anything uh we have like proper workflow authoring and then we know uh who is producing which data consuming which data and and all of that so governance also comes out of the box uh, a glimpse of how how the workflow.yaml then ends up into uh airflow uh, is here so basically uh we can see that a simple four line uh, in yaml which is data asset users just translates into a fancy step inside the airflow and then internally it's connected to the data availability service um, that we talked about and then uh, it knows when to exactly start um, the executing this workflow so basically all of the the wait for data comes out of the box similarly pyspark and also publish data assets moving on um yeah a little bit more details um uh, about how how these steps internally look like so these steps are implemented as uh, deferable operators again we all know like uh, the benefits of the deferable operators which is like it helps us scale a, a lot so we have one airflow installation which is used by a lot of users we have almost like 2000 dags and we are able to scale that that uh, uh that well because um the actual polling and the actual um uh, waiting for something to complete happens in the trigger and the scheduler and the worker like have uh, do not have that much load the philosophy that we have is to use airflow as pure orchestrator so so apart from data availability service it's also connected to a compute service so the actual computation runs on kubernetes it doesn't run inside the worker um and then uh, that is the one which also has access to to the data so um yeah so here like airflow is like itself pretty lightweight i am also going to spend some time talking about the access i said that like we have a lot of users uh using the same airflow instance and uh, yeah how that works is we have uh, uh, we we define a collection of workflows and then we create uh, this access policy so on the right what you see at the top is there is an access policy for a group of workflows and then you can see like uh, it's our internal tool which is which we use to manage it and there is like a users section there so so that is how users get access to specific workflows uh, and then also in the airflow you can see inside the user there is like a specific role and 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 the role itself has specific permission so it's like very granular access so although everyone can see the workflows on the on the ui uh, not everyone can execute them or run them uh, and the last part is of course like uh, alerting because we have the yaml and we have the capability to convert it into a dag we add uh, a lot of boilerplate code so we use the callback so that uh, the alerts end up in yet another tool that booking like we have in booking call alert api and then users can subscribe to the alerts via slack email and like uh, pager duty and all of that yeah next i will hand over to my colleague alex uh, who is going to talk about uh, our plans of shifting to astronomer thank you Yeah, I'll try and make it quick. Uh yeah, I'm Alex. I'm uh, also an engineer at Booking. So right now we're shifting to Astronomer and the uh the architecture mostly stays the same. It's just the airflow as a scheduler is now managed by Astro. 
and the why we changes and learnings that we have uh, running this pilot project for now. Why? So internal adoption grows. We have about 1,000 workflows, and we plan to, uh, over the next few years, migrate thousands of more Uzi workflows. Also, Astronomer takes care of reliability. They takes care about the uptime, being on call 24-7. Like, we largely based in Europe, so we don't have that much coverage uh, outside of uh, that time zone. It's easier to upgrade to newer Airflow versions, which you think it's easy, but if you tried it, like, yeah, it's like it's a pain to, to upgrade. And like uh, Astronomer, like, you just, I want a newer version that upgrades you automatically with all the database schema changes. Uh, it's easy to set up scaling and auto-scaling. Uh, and also we have support from the engineers, not only from them being on call, but also with uh, architectural advice, or uh, since Astronomer is a big contributor to the Airflow open source project, uh, they, can ha they have our ear, we have their ear, <laughs> asking for taking care of uh, some uh, Airflow issues that are like we w want to prioritize. What changes? Network integration, we need to, uh, as opposed to having like in our internal fabric, uh, both on-prem and extended to the clouds, the astronomer lives it in their own cloud. We uh, we did not even want to manage the AWS account where the uh, Airflow is deployed. All of this is managed by Airflow. We don't want to touch it as much as possible. Uh, we can access it through VPNs, so was easy and painless. And since we only use Airflow as an orchestrator, we don't need to transfer that much data back and forth. So it works great for us. Service to service certification again, since uh, all of our service to service works based on the sidecars deployed on our internal. Uh, Kubernetes, uh, big managed uh, infrastructure clusters, it, that was easy to have our own uh, self-managed airflow, but switching to Astronomer, we need to find uh, workarounds how to authenticate to internal services. We use Okta as identity provider, and that worked pretty great also for us. Big change is deck deployment flow, since again, we cannot use sidecars in the Astronomer environment. We now switch to CI push. Uh, the having sidecar was very uh, beneficial for us because we have thousands of DAGs, and whenever change happens, the sidecar can like almost immediately within like tens of seconds pick it changes from S3. We cannot have this with Astro, so every few minutes we do a CI push of all the contents of the DAG S3 bucket to Astronomer. The upside of that is that the workers start up immediately. They are all in sync which versions of the DAGs are deployed to all the workers. And also it helps with the cold start when we need to upscale or you need to restart or change the versions. So instead of like tens of minutes, you can uh, have restart in a, in a few minutes. User access also changes. So before we were using Airflow's internal DAG roles uh, and assigning teams to DAG roles and DAG roles managing the specific permissions per DAG. Uh, since Astro takes uh, care of the authentication and provides higher level uh, authentication for the users. It does not allow though like more granular access within each Airflow deployment. What we kind of compromised on is that we'll have Airflow deployments per company's department and everyone within the department will have wide access within the this Airflow deployment to, to trigger and stop markers failed or all the DAGs. But we are also working with Astronomer with them to either find workarounds how we can use callbacks when the uh, DAG starts, for example, to check if the user should have the, those permissions. Uh, and they're also working on improving this user access model. And in Fresco, to provision the instances and change the user definition, we had to write our own wrappers to do in Fresco since Terraform provider was not available at the time and it's still uh, right now is available, but it, in the public preview. But it was relatively easy to do because uh, the Astro API makes it very easy to just with a few calls, you get all your instance or you modify the instance. Uh, so that CI wrappers uh, were not that hard to set up. Uh, what did we learn shifting to Astronomer is that uh, doing a proof of concept before going all in, uh, just try with a few workflows and this exposed a lot of stuff you need to connect uh, for internal systems from the Astronomer or what problems that you might face. And also another thing is doing cost analysis was a bit of a surprise for us, like as opposed to what we thought our configuration and cost and like the, the scaling up and down would be. It was a bit different than what it dared to be and that influenced our structure, like which, what amount of deployments do we need, how we want to structure this, because our case like is slightly different to what a lot of other organizations use. We use Airflow as an orchestrator, but with a lot of users using it and a lot of DAGs. So it's kind of influenced our decisions.